It's been said that the whole Bible can be portrayed as a very long answer uh, to a very simple question. And that is, what can God do about the sin and rebellion in the human race? What can God do about the sin and rebellion in the human race? Well, the Gospel of Matthew is going to propose an answer to that for us. And in doing so, he's going to point the whole time to this guy named Jesus. Now, the Gospel of Matthew, we call it the Gospel of Matthew because according to church tradition and some other internal uh, criteria, it seems like the guy named Matthew, who was one of Jesus' apostles, is actually the one who wrote the book. But he never signed his name to it. It seems like after a couple decades, after Jesus had died and then risen and ascended to heaven, he got a a whole bunch of oral tradition stories about who Jesus was and, and Matthew's own experiences with Jesus. And then he writes them down in this story that we call the Gospel of Matthew. And he writes this story because it seems like he writes the kind of story that he himself would actually want to read. Now, maybe you guys have written papers for like college or high school or that sort of thing. And the most exciting thing about doing that is when you come to the end and then you burn them all, right? Did anyone do that? We totally did that. We just burned all of the high school papers we wrote. It was great. Uh, we didn't light anything else on fire, all right? Um, but it was, it was a t- sorry, there's a firefighter right here. So I'm just like, I got to clarify, it was all safe. Uh, But this guy, Matthew, he writes this kind of story that he wants to to read. It's because it's the story where he knew where he had come from and the kind of change that this man, Jesus of Nazareth, had brought into his own life. You see, he met Jesus and it completely turned his life around. And Matthew is this guy who's just absolutely enamored with Jesus of Nazareth. And Mark gives us a little bit of a picture why in in his gospel. You don't have to turn there, but this is how it goes. And Matt says, as Jesus uh, was passing by, he saw a guy named Levi, who we know from elsewhere is Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. And he's not there to pay his taxes. He's actually there to collect other people's taxes. And back in that day, the taxes that you told someone they owed, you had the authority of Rome behind you to say that they owed it. And if they didn't want to pay, and maybe you were kind of fluffing the numbers a little bit, you had Roman authority to kind of get the troops to make them do what you told them. Because of that, you could imagine tax collectors were not people's favorite, as they are today, right? (laughs) I know what you were thinking. Um, But Matthew's that kind of guy. He's the kind of guy that sits at a tax booth and effectively cheats people out of their money. So he's not very popular with people. In fact, when the scribes, the Bible teachers of the day, and the Pharisees start talking about this guy, they lump tax collectors in the same category as they do sinners. They just put the two together, and then they're wondering why this guy named Jesus is sitting around having meals with tax collectors and sinners. And Jesus, on hearing this, he responds with this. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to call not the righteous, but sinners. See, Jesus came to call guys who didn't have their life altogether. Guys who had a lot of baggage. Folks who had done really bad things to other people. People, the kind of people that know they need a physician. The kind of people that know they need saving. Yet so often, those are the kind of people that the world looks at and says, they're too far gone. I mean, nobody can help them. Nobody can help you. You, The things you've done are just too terrible. But in meeting Jesus, Matthew finds that his opinion is rather quite different. See, he gets to meet this guy, Jesus, and he wants to show us, I believe, as we go through this story that he's written, the Gospel of Matthew, That the pain and the loss and the havoc, the baggage that each of us bring here every Sunday morning, all the brokenness of our life, it can be met with this man, Jesus of Nazareth, who wants to offer us healing in life, who wants to turn your life around much like he did this man, Matthew. So Matthew, he's collected and arranged this tapestry of stories, these experiences with Jesus, And he's comprised them to highlight certain things about the kind of man that Jesus is, about the person who he is. He wants us to know, as we'll get to see, that this Jesus is the promised one from God. 
and that this Jesus is a new kind of Moses who's shown up on the scene that's going to bring in and inaugurate God's kingdom. It's his rescue operation to reach into the whole world and to confront evil and restore humanity to right relationship with God under God's reign and rule. He's going to do it by creating a whole new family. And I say he's a new kind of Moses because he's going to teach this kingdom. It's an upside down kind of kingdom. And there's no privileged people here. And what Jesus is going to do is fulfill God's instruction to Moses and to do it in such a way that he's able to transform hearts to love and follow Jesus. Now, by the time he gets to the actual ministry of Jesus where he starts to do these things, we're already in chapter 3. So as we wade our way through the first couple chapters, we'll find that G uh, Matthew wants us to know uh, who Jesus is. He says in Matthew chapter 1 that this is the book of the origins of Jesus, Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham. And this isn't just background information that he's throwing at us here. And if I were just to tell you, hey, this morning we're going to talk about a genealogy, I would lie because that's next week. Come back for that. It's going to be tons of fun, right? But this idea of a genealogy, and you guys hear it and you think like, is this just some sort of family tree, right? They just do like a DNA sample and tell you, hey, these are the people that came before you. I mean, that doesn't sound that interesting. But this word for genealogy is actually the word genesis. It means beginning or origin. See, Matthew wants to tell us about the origins of the story of Jesus. It's not just a family tree that we'll find in these first couple chapters. It's the whole story of how Jesus got here. And what Matthew is going to do is he's going to interpret these historical events, the things that have happened through a new kind of theological eye. And he's going to see how the events of the present tie back to the promises that God has made from the past that lead us up to this man named Jesus. And it's that that will undergird our confidence when we get into the story that Jesus' birth and his death, they're no tragedy or failure. It's not any accident of God's part, but this is actually the fulfillment of God's promises. I mean, his love in action to come and to save me and to save you. But really, the story of Jesus' origins, it's a really strange story. I mean, it's not just strange because we're about to start talking about Christmas and it's only September, <laughs> right? But because our familiarity with these stories, it doles our imagination and our attention to the detail that Matthew offers us. Sometimes going through the Christmas story, it may feel like watching reruns of something for like the 30th time, right? You already know what's going to happen, and so you don't pay much attention. And often with that, we miss the color or the darkness that's there. But really, I believe that these stories are profound, and Matthew's placed these specific stories really intentionally. See, he selects five of them that tell us who, how, why, where, and when about Jesus. And between each of these, he, he inserts these prophecies. They're punctuated by these little prophecies that look back about how what's happening in the life of Jesus is actually the fulfillment of, again, what God has always promised. And it's a really strange story. It's a strange story, and so as we go through this over the next couple of weeks, we'll have to kind of deconstruct our, our Christmas pageant idea about the birth story of Jesus. Just by getting into the first couple names in the book, we have to wade through this list of adulterers and polygamists, prostitutes and murderers, foreigners, a nation that goes to exile, all within the first couple verses. And by the time we get through that, we encounter in verse 18, this young girl whose name is Mary, who, by the way, is a pregnant, unmarried virgin. Okay, you got to admit, that's kind of weird, right? But this is the story he tells us. And then this pregnant, unmarried virgin is betrothed to a guy named Joseph who follows orders from an angel that he sees in his dreams. And then he's told to name his not yet wife's kid the hope of the world and God himself. Following that, after they give birth to this child because some foreign Roman empire wants to raise taxes and tells everyone to go back to their place of birth, they travel 80 miles. And then after they give birth to this child, these astrologers, these stargazing foreigners show up at their door and begin to worship their baby and to sign over their trust funds to him. It's just a weird story. And then this young family, you know, in the middle of trying to get a good night's sleep with a young baby, all of a sudden Joseph meets an angel, once again in a dream, who says, hey, rise and run to Egypt. 
And why? Because just from six miles away in Jerusalem, this psychopathic king has ordered his soldiers to come and to kill this baby. And so this king goes out to murder their baby. Well, they make it out of time, out of town in time, but on their way to Egypt, they, uh, they must have learned that the, the wreckage that was left behind them is a small genocide. It's probably 25 to 50 young boys were murdered trying to kill theirs. Finally, years later, they get to return from exile when they hear that psychopathic king number one has died, but they arrive back home to find out that, sure enough, his son, psychopathic king number two, is still on the throne. And so instead of going to any known location, the family moves out to Nazareth, which literally means the sticks. And then we open up into chapter three, and we encounter this guy named John. And John is a guy who eats funny food, wears funny clothes, calls people funny names, and dunks people underwater. <laughs> This is the story of Jesus' origin. But then it gets really weird because then Jesus shows up and himself wants to get dunked. John's like, I don't know if that's a good idea. Jesus says, sure enough, it is. So they dunk him. He comes out of the water. The heavens split open. A voice from heaven comes down. This dove descends like uh, the, the Holy Spirit that rests on this guy. And then Jesus goes out into the wilderness where he effectively starves himself for 40 days and 40 nights being tempted by the Satan. But sure enough, don't worry, it gets only better when after all of that goes through, Jesus is then uh, taken care of by a bunch of angels who offer room service to help him get better. <laughs> and this is the story of the origins of Jesus the Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, Matthew, as he's telling all of these things, he knows that he's writing this to a primarily Jewish audience, the kind of people that grew up studying and knowing the Hebrew scriptures. And, and as we'll come to find out, this guy, Matthew himself, is actually quite the Bible nerd. He knows his Old Testament, and he quotes from it significantly at the beginning and the very end of this gospel. But he would have known this story, and too often for us in our Western ears, we miss some of the details. So we're going to have to work hard to keep up with what Matthew is saying. And so what we want to do today is an overview to this book, is try and unpack the bomb that Matthew drops in verse 1, that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of David and the son of Abraham. So here's how we're going to do this. And I invite you guys to track with me where we begin in Genesis and we're going to work our way all the way through the Old Testament and try and arrive somewhere up here at Matthew 1. All right. Are you guys ready for this? All right. Hang in there with me because this gets awesome in getting to see who this man, Jesus of Nazareth, actually is. But you guys know how the story begins. In the very beginning, God creates the heavens and the earth, and God's just amazed by it. I mean, five different times he says, man, this is good. But then it gets better because he creates man and woman, and then he says, man, this is very good. And we're told that unlike any of the animals, this man and woman are created in the very image of God. I mean, they're there to represent who God is in his rule, in his partnership, to rule over all of creation. He, gives the, he blesses them and gives this man and woman everything they need to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. He gives man what he needs to flourish and represent God's character and authority over the whole earth. And this is a pretty awesome thing, and all they have to do is trust God. But you flip a few pages more, and you find out that, sure enough, that's exactly what they don't do. And there's what we call the fall in Genesis chapter 3. And sin enters in on the scene there in the garden where man and woman, instead of trusting God, trust in themselves. And instead of loving God, their love turns inward, thinking they can make themselves like God himself. And so they eat of the fruit, giving in to the temptation of the serpent. And there in the garden, this sin results in nakedness and shame and cursing. Things that we're too familiar with in our own day. These fractured relationships now between God and man and between a man and his wife. And in God's mercy, he has to exile them from the garden, but not before he promises them that he will deal with this serpent. That a seed from the woman will come and crush the head of their enemy. After that, they exit stage left towards the east out of the garden and the story just spirals down from there. I mean, Genesis 3 through the, the, the next uh, eight or so chapters, just like flushing the toilet and just watching every, the whole world just spiral down. 
and brother begins to kill brother. A man kills a boy just for injuring him, just a little bit, just a bruise, but he murders him for it. Men begin to abuse women, and then there's this, this death beat that just beats throughout the chapters of death begins to reign in what used to be God's good creation. And as one author puts it, he says, the world unraveled as sin enfolded humanity in its tentacles destroying God's good creation to the point where God gives this kind of state of the world speech in Genesis chapter 6. And Yahweh saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intention of his thoughts of his heart was only evil all of the time. How did we get to this? Better yet, what is God going to do about this? And God knows just what he's going to do. And he pushes the reset button and he sends a flood to wash it all away, to wash humanity away. But because God is gracious, he preserves one man and his family. Despite human evil, God decides to make what's called a covenant with this man. And it's this agreement between two parties where they partner together for the mutual good of the other. And in most covenants, both sides have some sort of role to play, but uniquely in this first covenant, God makes promises and requires nothing of man. God's promise is that he will be gracious and that until the end of time, man's existence will owe only to his grace as he will never again destroy the earth by a flood. And so God, like a warrior who's finished his battle, sets his bow down in the sky as a reminder of this promise. And it's a warrior's bow that he sets down, but it's a bow that's not pointing down at the earth, but pointing up into the very heart of heaven, because the story is not over yet. Man has been saved, but there's another guard in sin. And so Noah comes off of the ark, and shortly thereafter, he plants a vineyard. He grows a bunch of grapes, he harvests them, he got his toes all squishy, smooshed them around or something, and then he makes all this wine. He gets drunk, and some sketchy thing happens in his tent with his son. And all of a sudden after this, we see that uh, there's another story of nakedness and of shame and of cursing. Does it sound familiar? You see, the judgment of God washing the earth clean, it may have changed the topography of the land, but it did not change the heart of man. So as one author writes again, that Noah is instructive because it shows that being given a fresh start and a clean slate is an insufficient remedy for the human plight. See, something more will have to change. What is God going to do about the problem of human sin and rebellion? He's promised to preserve the earth in spite of the human condition, but something is going to have to change if we're to see creation ever be good again. But frankly, the toilet's not done flushing and things just keep spiraling down and down and down. Then eventually they spiral up and up and up in what's known as the Tower of Babel. And it's man building this frontal attack, not trying to climb so much the corporate ladder as the divine one. Because man gathers himself together to put a frontal attack on God and ascend themselves up into heaven. Well, they don't get there because God actually has to come down to see what's going on. And he shows up and instead of just stepping on their tiny little tower, he decides to be merciful and not destroy them. Instead, he confuses the language and he scatters man, forcing them to obey his command to be fruitful and multiply and to fill the earth. Interestingly enough here, we see this little picture early on in scripture of God choosing to love his enemy instead of destroy them. Something, if you fast forward down a way, you'll find Jesus speaking of in Matthew chapter 5, admonishing us to do the same, to love your enemies. Now, where did he get that idea? But before we can get there to Jesus, the story goes on. And in these first uh, chapters 3 through 11 of Genesis, everything has gone downhill, but something is about to change. And that long answer to the simple question of what God is about to do begins in Genesis chapter 12. All of a sudden, this global scope of the text zooms in on this one guy. And the call and the promise to a guy named Abram initiates God's mission to rescue and reverse the curse of sin. So from the scattering of Babylon, God calls Abram to emerge onto the scene. A guy called out, of, uh, called out of obscurity as the hope of the world. And he's the hope of the world because God makes another covenant with him. And he makes these astounding promises to this guy. He says that although Babylon had tried to make a name for themselves, God says he's going to give Abram a great name. 
A name, he's going to do something for him he could not do for himself. And next, he's also going to give Abram a people. That's a seed, descendants, who will represent him. And God is going to give Abram a land. Remember how they lost Eden? This will be a kind of new Eden where man can partner in relationship with God so that, as God tells Abram, they can be a blessing to all the families of the earth. God wants to restore his good creation And the other side of this covenant is that God tells Abram that all he has to do is to walk before him and to be blameless, to rightly represent God and his character. How do you think that's going to go? And you see, God begins to fulfill his promises to Abraham, but they're contingent on Abraham's obedience. But as you know the story, Abraham's perpetual disobedience continually jeopardizes the promises that God had made. God had said he would give Abram a son through Sarah, but he on several occasions kind of farms Sarah out. God said, I'd give you this land, but immediately, a few verses after that, Abraham takes his family out of the land and heads down towards Egypt, continually jeopardizing the promises that God had made. And yet, God comes to this scenario where he swears on his own life that despite his partner's failure to keep up his end of the deal, God would still make his descendants as numerous as the stars. Something that later on in a book of, called Numbers, there's this dude who talks to his donkey, looks up and says that a star is going to rise in Jacob. It's a star that later on astrologers will look and see and find their way to Bethlehem looking for a king. A king that in Genesis 17, God told Abraham, kings are going to come from you. And the scepter of that king is not going to depart from, we find out later on, the tribe of Judah until the tribute of all the nations of the earth come to him. Foreshadows God's promises that he's going to make later on. But in the meantime, Abraham takes matters into his own hands, not trusting God to fulfill the promise his way, he tries to pull it off. Not with Sarah, who God had promised would bear him a son, but through her handmaiden, this Egyptian slave named Hagar. But still, despite Abram's continued failure to trust God, to walk before him and be blameless, this tension grows. You see, because God is determined to save the world through human partners. He doesn't just snap his fingers. He works through people. But he knows that these human partners will continue to fail. And so there's this really weird covenant-making ceremony that takes place between God and Abram. And he tells Abraham to go and to to get all these different animals, to cut them in half and to flip them on their sides and kind of create this walkway between them. And usually how it would work is then both parties in a covenant would walk between these animals saying, I swear on my life to uphold my end of the deal. And if I don't, so help me because otherwise I'm saying, let my life be chopped in two like these dead animals. It's a really weird ceremony. We don't do that for weddings or anything anymore, right? (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Um, But how it works out, actually, is instead of both parties going down this aisle together, Abraham falls asleep in this deep, dark sleep, and God goes through these dead animal pieces all by himself. As though to say, he's not only going to keep up his end of the deal, but he's also swearing on his life to uphold Abraham's end of the deal, even knowing that Abraham is and will continue, as long, along with all of his descendants, to fail, to walk before God and to be blameless. So this covenant then becomes, however, the basis for all of God's dealings with the human race from this point on. Everything that God does is to fill, fulfill this promise to Abraham. He's not going to allow his partner's failure to determine the fate of the world. Though disloyalty is endemic in the human partner, God knows he's going to keep his promise. But how is he going to do it? I mean, if Abraham can't uphold his end of the covenant, how will God uphold it since he has staked his life on it? Will God himself have to die for his covenant partner's failure? And through the rest of the story, despite the failure of God's human partners, God never retracts or fails on his promises, no matter what it costs him. You guys know if you finish reading through Genesis, it it ends with these promises beginning to come true. God said he would make a nation of Abraham, and Abraham and Sarah now become over 70 people and find their way down to Egypt. You open up the book of Exodus, and this small nation has now become a great people, so numerous that the Egyptians are terrified of them and throw them into bondage to try and oppress them. But just as God had promised, they become a great people. 
And then God finds his way down to Egypt to rescue them from slavery. He brings them across the Red Sea and begins to give them the land. But before they can get there, they have to make a stop at a place called Mount Sinai. And it's there that God makes another covenant with his people through a guy named Moses. And this covenant is teaching them how to be a people who live in right relationship with God. So that through them, God can bless all of the families of the earth. In fact, God goes so far as to say that they will be a kingdom of priests. Priests who represent God to the rest of humanity. Who represent true human partnership with God. And walk in right relationship with God. And so there's these two verses in Exodus chapter 19 that are just as important as those in Genesis 12 and John 3, 16. Where God says, hey, if you obey me, then there will be life. But if you disobey, then there will be cursing and exile. And this is an opportunity for Israel to say we want it or we don't want it. And three separate times they sign the dotted line. We will be faithful. We will obey. You know how the story goes. And as this tension develops where God says obedience brings life, he says it to a bunch of people who can't obey. And now God has staked his blessing all of the nations, even his own life on the obedience of a wicked and corrupt people to not live wickedly and corruptly. How's that going to go? Well, we find out just a few chapters later, though they had sworn to follow God faithfully in Exodus chapter 32 with God still there on the mountain. They commit debauchery, they fornicate themselves, and they commit idolatry. They make a golden calf and they bow down and worship that, breaking the first two commands that they had just signed on the dotted line to not do. And so Exodus turns into Leviticus and God presents to them a way to temporarily fix Israel's sins. They no longer are going to be a kingdom of priests, but they become a kingdom with priests because now they have to deal with the sin in their own lives. Leviticus turns to the book of Numbers and because of Israel's continued failure, God has to discipline them and they wander in the wilderness for 40 years as generations die off, all in preparation for the book of Deuteronomy, where now the law is re-given to a new generation of people who are there standing on the banks of the Jordan, getting ready to go to the other side. And before they get there, their coach gives them a really pessimistic speech. And so at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, this is what Moses says to him. Not a very promising speech. He says, For I know that after my death you will surely act corruptly and turn aside from the way that I've commanded you. And in the days to come, evil is going to befall you because you will do what is evil in the sight of Yahweh, provoking him to anger through the works of your hands. How is God going to keep his promise to Abraham if Israel can't obey? If they're going to obey so that God can keep his promises, he's going to have to deal with his covenant people's sin more permanently. And then he's somehow going to have to enable the people to obey, something that they can't do so far, it seems. He's going to have to transform their hearts, not just give them a law written on stones. And also before Moses passes on, he, he encourages his people to look for a prophet like him. And then later on, Matthew, if we were to fast forward again, brings Jesus onto the scene, who is a kind of new Moses. You see, Jesus comes on the scene and he comes out of Exodus from being in exile there, from Egypt, excuse me. He comes out from there and then he crosses the Jordan in this baptism. And then he goes off to the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. And then he comes and how Moses died is he went up on a mountain and sat down and died. Then Matthew chapter 5 begins with Jesus coming and sitting down on a mountain and not dying, but actually giving a new instruction. He says, you've heard it said like this from Moses, but I tell you this. You see, Jesus will become this new Moses. But we have to rewind again because Moses just finished giving this speech. And how do we get to Jesus? Well, we have to go through the book of Joshua. So the people finally cross the Jordan, they go into the land, they divide and they conquer it, they spread it out and they separate, and then we enter into the book of Judges, where the people are in the land, but all these different little nation states kind of scattered around, and the book of Judges, guys, is dark in every way, all right? Not the sort of thing you so much study on your honeymoon or something like that, right? It's just depressing. This cycle just keeps repeating itself, where the people break the covenant with God, 
and then God sends some thing or, or some nation to discipline them. They carry that burden for a while until finally they're fed up with it. They repent and call out to God who then sends a hero to save them. A guy maybe like Gideon that we talked about a few weeks ago. They get saved and then they're doing uh, good for a little bit of time, but then all of a sudden they just go back and break the covenant again. And again, another nation comes in and the cycle just keeps repeating itself throughout the whole book until we get towards the end. And then there's this little refrain that kind of tells us a bit of what's going on here. And in Judges chapter 21, we're told that in those days, there was no king in Israel. And so everyone did what was right in his own eyes. It would seem to imply that a king could somehow help the people out here. But because they didn't have a king, they didn't have a faithful representative to model right relationship with God. It was just this scene of moral relativism and everyone just did what they wanted rather than following God. The absence of a king here is a bad thing. And so at the end of the book, Israel is asking for a king, but they're not asking for a king for the right reasons. They don't want a king who models Yahweh and his law to them. They want a king like the nations. And so you flip the pages and you're in the book of 1 Samuel, and that's exactly what God gives them. A king who's a stud of a man, but also a bit of a coward. Turns out he has no heart to follow God. He's a total flop. His name is Saul. He's throwing spears at this little shepherd boy whose name is David, who's quite the harp player. And David is the one that God invites to become king, a man after his own heart. And it's at the end of towards, uh, actually the beginning of the book of 1 Samuel, where the nation of Israel is almost at its height. I mean, the Ark of the Covenant that represents the throne of God had just come into this new capital in Jerusalem. And we're told that there's peace and justice all around David and his empire. And it's in that situation where a man is rightly following God's law that there's peace and justice and God is enthroned and he comes and he makes another covenant with this guy named David. And God promises to give David a great name. The thing that Babylon couldn't achieve for themselves and all of the promises that God had given to Abram, now he channels those in through this servant David. See, what God had planned for the nation as a whole, it's now to be implemented through the king and his leadership. They need a king who will follow God. And so God tells David that his sons need to model this kind of true humanity to rightly partner with God to remain faithful to the Israelite covenant that God had made with Moses and Israel at Mount Sinai. The guys, they needed to write it down each day and to learn it so that they would do it as the king. And why? So that they would rightly resemble relationship with God and they would lead the nation to do the same. And when they could do that, then that would establish justice and peace that would allow the nation of Israel to bring the blessing to Abraham to all the nations of the world. But God further promises, and he goes on to say that he will discipline any disobedient son of David who does not rightly model God and his standards, who fails to live up to the law. But eventually a son, he says, will come who will obey perfectly. See, God promises a future king who will faithfully follow him and so actually be able to lead the people to peace and to justice and to being a blessing forever. In 2 Samuel 7, where this covenant takes place, God says, I will be to him a father, and he will be to me a son. So whoever this son is will be both a son of David, but also a son of God. Again, fast forward, and you remember the scene where the, the heavens break open as Jesus comes up out of the water, and a voice from heaven comes out and says, This is my son. My beloved son, could that really be who Jesus is? But still in the story, there's this tension because as long as David's sons disobey, the kingdom cannot be secure forever. And the psalmist says it's an if-then relationship that Yahweh swore to David a sure oath from which he will not turn back. One of the sons of your body I will set on your throne if your sons keep my covenant and my testimonies that I teach them. Then... Their sons also forever shall sit on your throne. And then Jesus comes later and he says, he's not a, someone who's come to abolish the law, but actually to fulfill it, to be the faithful son who can keep God's covenants. And then we go into the book of 1 Kings and God's promises are coming true. 
But the unfortunate side of those promises where Yahweh says to Solomon, hey, since this has been your practice and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I've commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you and will give it to your servants. God's promise about disciplining David's sons comes true and he takes the kingdom away from Solomon. It goes to Solomon's son, this dude named Rehoboam, who's quite the fool, and he ends up dividing the entire kingdom into two because he's not committing himself to God's covenant. And so we find that the unfaithfulness of any of David's descendants will only lose them the kingdom. If God's kingdom is to come and establish justice and peace, they need a faithful representative. So the tension continues. As the king went, so goes the nation. And eventually they lead the nation off into exile. Exile from the land that was going to be the new Eden where man could be in right relationship with God. We go into the book of 2 Kings and this is what we find. Disobedient kings always bring ruin. When Yahweh had torn Israel from the house of David, then they make Jeroboam the son of Nevat king. And Jeroboam drove Israel from following Yahweh, and he made them commit great sin. And the people of Israel walked in all the sins that Jeroboam did. They didn't depart from them until Yahweh removed Israel out of his sight as he had spoken by all of his servants, the prophets. So Israel was exiled from their own land to Assyria until that day. See, the kingdom can never be eternally secure in the hands of a sinner. It's going to take a faithful king to come and to secure God's people forever so that he can restore this blessing to all of humanity. This is the thing that the prophets speak out about through all of the prophets, but eventually the people don't listen and exile is what they get. They're cast out of the land that God had promised to give them so they could rightly represent him. And then years later, they get to return to the land, but things are really no better. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, Malachi that we just went through not too long ago, again, Israel's heart is still hard and it's not changed. But even then, the prophets are reminding Israel that God would still be faithful to his promise despite their failure. And Jeremiah, who was a bit of a sad guy to be around, he speaks in Jeremiah 23 about a Messiah who's to come, someone anointed with God's spirit. He says that this person will be David's righteous seed, just like the seed of the woman. And this guy is going to come and he's going to reign as a king and he's going to deal wisely and establish justice and righteousness in the land so as to save Israel. And Jeremiah goes on to say that this guy's name will be Yahweh is my righteousness. You see, God is saying that he himself will be the righteousness that his people need. It's at Jesus' baptism, remember that he talks to John and convince him to be baptized because Jesus says, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. Another prophet, a guy comes on the scene, Isaiah, and he says that the Messiah to come is going to have all these crazy divine names. Things like wonderful counselor and mighty God, and Christmas songs coming to your mind, right? Everlasting father and prince of peace. And also a name called Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, God says he's going to come and to be the righteousness that his people need with his people. It's one of the two names that Matthew calls out of Jesus is that he will be Emmanuel, the son of David who will bring the blessing promised to Abraham and somehow fulfill what God himself had promised, to be a son of David and also a son of God himself. And there will be no end to the rise of his government and he will sit on the throne of David forever a king. Who is this one who is coming? And further, we're told by other prophets that he's coming, and when he does, he will forgive sins, things that only God can do. And not just forgive sins, he'll also heal diseases. Isaiah says that the eyes of the blind will be opened, the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then shall the lame man leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute sing for joy. Fast forward, we get back to the book of Matthew, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing. He's giving uh, hearing to those who can't hear. He's opening the eyes of the blind. He, He gives feet to the lame man. He gives tongue to the mute, all fulfilling the promises that God had made. However, when we get to the end of those Hebrew scriptures, and we come to those blank pages, it's for centuries that the Hebrew people are waiting for this guy to come, and he hasn't. 
And they're waiting for someone who's going to come and step on crushing the head of the serpent. Someone that's the seed of Abraham who can bring this blessing to all of the nations. They're looking for someone, a prophet, like a new Moses who can come and, and lead God's people to freedom from bondage and teach them how to rightly follow God. And they're looking for a righteous king, a son of David, who's going to model and empower what obedience looks like and also enable the people to somehow follow God themselves so that they can be a blessing to all the nations of the world. And they're looking for a son of God who can come with divine names and end up forgiving sins and healing the sick. But all of this, not so much remembering that God himself would still have to pay the price for the failure of his covenant partner. And somehow God is going to have to change their hearts so that they can take part in being part of the kingdom that Jesus is going to bring. So then Matthew, finally, he shows up on the scene and he writes this verse in the beginning of his book that this is the origin of Jesus, Messiah, son of David, Son of Abraham, could this man, Jesus, really be the fulfillment of everything that God had promised to save people and to restore humanity? The angel tells this guy, Joseph, to name uh, this baby Jesus, and it means that Yahweh saves. We're told that he will save his people from their sins to give him the name Emmanuel that means God is with us. And John calls coming, calling everyone to repentance because the kingdom of God is at hand. Then a voice comes out of heaven and says, this one is my beloved son. And then that one is empowered with the spirit of God to forgive sins and heal the blind, the sick, the lame, and even raise the dead. This one comes who, like Moses then in Matthew 5, sits down on a mountain and begins to declare a new teaching, all the while fulfilling God's law, not abolishing it. And eventually, this man, Jesus, Matthew tells us, ends up giving his own life. Matthew believes this is God in the flesh, coming to atone for the failure of his covenant partner. And then he's raised to life once again, He's raised up as a king, and Jesus says before he ascends that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So go, therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and Holy Spirit. And behold, look, I am with you, God with us. Can this really be who Jesus is, the hope of the world, the one that can meet us in our brokenness and our baggage and call us to follow him? to restore all of humanity. And following Jesus, can this really be what our lives could look like, to turn around and be healed from diseases and sickness and sin and even death? You see, before Jesus goes to the cross, he's there in an upper room with his disciples, and he inaugurates what he calls as a new covenant. It's a new covenant where he makes promises, but they're not promises which require obedience from you guys that you guys cannot fulfill. See, Jesus says that this is the blood of my covenant. That my body is being broken for you. My blood is being shed out to atone for the failures of you. This is God giving his life as he covenants himself to a people who do not deserve it. Because he is such a gracious God who loves his enemies. And he invites us as we take of that bread and of that juice to remember that this is Jesus, Messiah, son of David, son of Abraham, God himself who has come to rescue us. At least that's the story Matthew writes. It's the kind of story he loves to read because it's his own story. Is it yours as well? 